Well, thanks very much, Georgina, and thank you, everybody here, for coming today. I'd like to acknowledge um, particularly Georgina for the invitation and also for the opportunity to be here for this uh, Menzies Institute. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my friend Nick Cater, um, and in particular, I'd like to single out David Kemp and Barry Jones, uh, two figures uh, that I have enormous respect and admiration for and I've had the privilege of interviewing um, in the past. Well, three summers ago, I took my wife and two children on a road trip. We went to Japarit, where Robert Menzies was born. Now, this is what I regard as a great family holiday. And you can imagine what my now teenage children thought when I explained to them where Japarit was, um, why it was important and why we were going there. So visiting Japarit, which is a thousand kilometres from home in Sydney, gave the four of us a unique insight into Menzies. It really is extraordinary that a boy born in the back of the family's general store in a small country town in 1894 could become Australia's Prime Minister. We visited the site of the family store. We peered through the windows of the then closed Hopetown House Hotel. Uh, we went to the site of the Mechanics Institute where Menzies borrowed books as a young boy. We examined the local archives at the Japarit Soldiers and Citizens Memorial Hall, visited the railway station, the general store, the local school and the museum. I was then completing my biography of Menzies, the first in 20 years, which was launched by Josh Frydenberg here in Melbourne in 2019. Menzies continues to loom large in Australian political life. He defined and he dominated an era in Australian politics and debate about his life and legacy has never settled, which makes him a very compelling biographical subject. In my book, I tried to capture the real Menzies, who he was, how he lived, what his values were, his virtues and his vices, and also how he gained and used political power. So visiting Japarit was essential in understanding young Robert and the man who became Australia's longest serving prime minister. From a young age, Menzies dreamed of becoming a lawyer. He insisted that he never had any ambition to be prime minister from a young age. I never had even heard of the prime minister when I was a small boy in Japarit, he later joked. And if I had, and know as much as I do now, I probably would have stayed in Japarit. But the genesis of the idea of becoming a lawyer came from a traveling phrenologist who visited Menzies primary school in Japarit. This form of pseudoscience claimed to be able to discern the personality traits by studying the contours of the skull. The phrenologist, a tall man of slim build with a graying beard and mutton chop whiskers, wore a dark suit with a white shirt and a thin black ribbon bow tie. He ran his hand over young Robert's skull and proclaimed with absolute certainty that he would become a barrister and public speaker. So when young Robert told his mother about the prediction, she informed him that actually to become a barrister, he needed to go to university. But the Menzies family could not afford to send him to university. So his only pathway was via scholarships. Menzies recalled, my course was chartered and my mind clear, provided that I could win enough free passages, that is scholarships and exhibitions to bring me to port. He duly won scholarships to study at universities, at university and also at schools in Ballarat and Melbourne. But to truly understand Menzies, you have to go back to where he came from, appreciate the family he grew up in, the formative people and events that influenced his future life. And that means again, starting in Japarit. So Robert Gordon Menzies was born in the small Victorian wheat town, about 350 kilometers from Melbourne on the 20th of December, 1894. He would be the last prime minister born in the 19th century. Robert was the fourth of five children born to James and Kate Menzies. He was named Robert after his paternal grandfather and his middle name Gordon was given in tribute to British Army Officer General, General Charles George Gordon. Young Robert was closest to his sister Belle and he admired his two older brothers, Les and Frank. But the two people who had the strongest influence on him in his youth were his mother and her brother, his uncle, Sidney Sampson. 
Sydney Sampson urged young Robert to read books from the Mechanics Institute in Japarit. And later, when Sydney, Sydney would give his nephew advice as he sought a career in state politics. Sydney Sampson was the member for Wimmera in the House of Representatives from 1906 to 1919. He had a big influence on me, Menzies said of Sydney. He would walk up and down the garden path and ask me questions as if I was his equal in age and experience. Menzies' upbringing in country Victoria could not be further from the establishment youth into which many of his later contemporaries in the law and politics were born. There was no family fortune and few family connections. In the 1890s, Japarit was just a small town with a dirt main street and about half a dozen businesses and a few score houses. The year before Menzies was born, when the family moved to Japarit, the population was estimated to be just 55. Menzies lived an isolated but not lonely life in Japarit. He had a loving family, he had many friends, and he had plenty of books to read. But Japarit was often hot, windy, and dusty. There were few trees in the centre of town, rain was collected in galvanised iron tanks, and of course, there was no electricity. Along Roy Street was a bank, a bakery, a butcher, a timber yard, two general stores, and the Hopetown House Hotel. By the end of the 1890s, the population of Japarit had grown to around 200 people. The Menzies family owned and operated the general store located on the corner of Roy and Charles Streets. The family lived in the back of the store and then later moved to a standalone house behind the store. James focused on the sale and servicing of farm machinery, while Kate worked behind the counter and managed the family home. Menzies gained a rudimentary understanding of small business and an appreciation of financial and economic matters. The store, like others, experienced some difficulty during challenging economic times. Farmers were often extended credit via merchants in Melbourne and charged high interest rates on loans extended to the store. Menzies recalled his childhood as a happy time, although he witnessed droughts and floods and had been born during the 1890s depression. He saw emus and kangaroos regularly, he swam and fished in Lake Hindmarsh, and he ran through the town with other kids. His parents encouraged his learning. This was an important in shaping the future man. Young Menzies borrowed books from the Mechanics Institute, as I mentioned, and the family read aloud to each other in the evenings. Menzies folded and delivered the local newspaper, perhaps sparking an interest in politics and public affairs. He began his formal schooling at the local state primary school on 4 June 1898. The school was originally located in the Mechanics Institute on Roy Street, close to the Menzies General Store, but a later moved to the outskirts of town, which is still just a five minute walk from his home. In these years, there were about 30 or, to four, 30 or 40 other students enrolled. There was a very strict learning routine and the cane or strap was used to discipline students without mercy. In 1951, Menzies returned to his primary school as prime minister. He enjoyed himself immensely. He told stories of the teachers and fellow students and he sat in a wooden desk at the rear of the classroom and raised his hand, pretending to answer a question asked by the teacher. He confessed that even at this young age, he felt that he was the bright boy of the class with nothing more to be learned. To understand young Robert, you also must understand his parents. James Menzies was born on 9 August 1862 in Ballarat. His father, Robert, and mother Elizabeth were born in Scotland. The family were rural tenant farmers. Robert migrated to Australia in 1855. He met Elizabeth in Victoria and married that same year. They owned and operated a small business that sold machinery to miners and together had 10 children of which James Menzies was the fourth. James wanted to be an artist but had to abandon plans to study art overseas on a scholarship when his father died and the family was left in difficult financial circumstances. James was able to later establish a coach painting business. Now, Menzies' relationship with his father was strained. Menzies described his father as very intense and serious. James was stern and strict and explosions of anger were very frequent. 
James Menzies was also devoutly religious, religious and was a Methodist lay preacher in Japarit, as there was no Presbyterian church in town. He dedicated himself to public service. He was a Dimbula Shire councillor, including serving two terms as president, and he later served in the Victorian Legislative Assembly. Now, Robert described his father as having a nervous tension and was embarrassed by his often overly emotional speeches in public. This would influence his own style and approach to speech making later in life. But Robert still respected his father and admired his commitment to public service. It is likely that this municipal and parliamentary career also rubbed off on young Robert. Lennox Hewitt, the famous public servant, worked with James Menzies at BHP for many years. Before he died, Lennox, uh, who was, I think, 101, told me that even in the 1930s, relations between James and Robert were very strained, but James was also immensely proud of his son. Sidney Sampson, Kate's brother, owned the general store in Japarit and published the local newspaper. He suggested the family relocate to Japarit, where the weather was warmer, and take over the ownership and running of the store. He thought it would help improve James's health. So the family moved, to Bal moved from Ballarat to Japarit in late 1893. James, having worked at BHP for many years, died on 1 November 1945 at home in Kew. Kate Menzies was born on 6 November 1865 in Creswick, Victoria. Her father, John Sampson, and mother Mary had migrated from England. Kate was one of nine children born to John and Mary. When Kate was just 12 years old, her mother died. And John, who was a founding member of the Amalgamated Miners Association, later remarried. Kate attended to her children and managed the family home in addition to working in the store. She never complained about living in an isolated country town with a difficult husband or contending with several children. Robert had a very affectionate and loving relationship with his mother. He found her to be more balanced in her temperament than his father with an appreciation of the lighter side of life. He described her as having a beautiful face and a calming personality that often helped to soothe her husband's eruptions of anger. Kate showed no favoritism to any of her children and even very late in life, she stressed that she loved them equally. She died on 30 June, 1946, also at home in Kew. James and Kate, who had met and courted in Ballarat, married on Christmas day, 1889. They had five children, Les, born in 1890, Frank, born in 1892, Belle, born in 1893, Robert, of course, born in 1894, and Sydney, born in 1905. They were a very typical middle-class family who prized Protestant values, such as hard work, thrift, self-respect, independence, and community service. In 1905, young Robert moved to Ballarat to continue his schooling at the Humphrey Street State School. Menzies lived with his paternal grandmother, Elizabeth Menzies, along with his sister, Belle, who had also moved schools. Les and Frank had already moved to Ballarat years earlier. Now, Robert and Belle lived in their grandmother's small wooden cottage on the western side of town, opposite an insane asylum. Robert won a scholarship to enrol at Grenville College, a private school in Ballarat, and commenced in 1908. Menzies recalled applying himself to his studies in these years very diligently. He was encouraged every day by his dour and devout grandmother. He studied for six hours from dinner until midnight, every night other than Sundays. Now Robert, his grandmother would say after dinner, go and get to your books. Robert and Belle explored the city to its fullest and also frequently visited their maternal grandfather, John Sampson. Samson was the first president of the Miners Association, the forerunner to the Australian Workers Union. So young Robert in his pre-teens would sit with his grandfather and read aloud articles from the worker. They would then debate the merits of the article with Robert often taking a contrary view to his grandfather. This gave Menzies an introduction to policy and political issues at a very young age and helped to formulate his own beliefs, many of which were contrary to those of his grandfather. At Grenville, Robert played cricket and Australian rules football, and he was known for his mimicry and oratory. 
we can see the young barrister and politician emerging with an eye for the spotlight. And after a few years of study, Robert sat the senior public examination and won a scholarship to prestigious Wesley College here in Melbourne. And so in 1910, Menzies enrolled at Wesley when he was 15 years old. By this time, James and Kate had also relocated to Melbourne, having made a tenfold profit on a 640-acre farm in Japarit. Menzies was known at Wesley for being confident, overly proud, somewhat arrogant, but of course he had much to be proud of. He was charming and good looking, he often, but he often rubbed people the wrong way with his arrogance and his ambition. These qualities, of course, would help carry him into politics and help him to attain state and federal ministry positions and the prime ministership, but he would pay a price for this, I think, in 1941. His academic results were mixed and he did not win a scholarship to university at the end of his first or second year at Wesley. Percy Josky, who knew Menzies then, said he did not shine in his first years. But at the end of his third year, Menzies won an exhibition or scholarship to study at university. He enrolled in a Bachelor of Laws here at the University of Melbourne in 1913. He did well, studying English, history, psychology, Latin and economics, and a range of law subjects in his third and fourth years. And he passed with first class honours. He went on to complete a Master of Laws in 1918 and collected a range of glittering prizes. He was also elected president of the Students' Representative Council, president of the Law Students' Society, president of the Students' Christian Union. He helped establish a historical society. He also became editor of Melbourne University magazine, which was published three times a year. In 1919, Menzies was employed as a sessional academic in the law school and then spent a year as an article clerk with a Melbourne solicitor. His star was now ascendant. Now, other speakers at this conference will talk about Menzies' education and legal career, but I want to mention this important discovery I made while writing my biography of Menzies. In 1972 and 1973, Menzies gave a series of interviews to journalist Francis McNichol for a biography, his official biography, that was never completed. These interviews had not been previously available. But in the interviews, Menzies talked about his upbringing. He reflected on political events, policies, personalities, and he offered political lessons drawn from his experience. One of the seminal events in Menzies' young life was his decision not to enlist in the First World War. The war had plunged the Menzies family into turmoil. His older brothers, Les and Frank, enlisted and were sent abroad. Bell had eloped with a soldier, George Green, and was banished from the family. Menzies revealed that his father was so stricken with grief that he nearly died. So after a family at a family conference, it was decided that Menzies, then still a university student, would not enlist, but would remain in Melbourne to help look after the family. This decision affected him very deeply. About 40% of young men in Australia enlisted to serve in the war. Menzies was branded a coward for not enlisting. And this, he said, had a very searing effect on my mind. So he decided to go into politics, viewing it as public service of some kind to erase the perceived stain on his name. I just had to do something to justify my existence, he recalled in these interviews. So the upshot was that the First World War was the decisive event that propelled Menzies into politics. It was not just a reason to stand for parliament, but the dominating reason, he said. Now, Robert Menzies returned to his birthplace of Japarit in the spring of 1966, following his retirement as prime minister. The occasion was the unveiling of a plaque affixed to the base of a 70 foot steel spire with an illuminated purple thistle atop that had been erected in his honour. It's still there today. It was a grand occasion. Japarit's population of 770 people more than trebled. Crowds lined the streets and, in wa and waved enthusiastically as Menzies' black chauffeur-driven car with its sink ports banner affixed to the front arrived. There were three pipe bands and two brass bands to herald his arrival. There were banners and streamers. The mood was absolutely electric. 
the small Wimmera township had not witnessed anything like it before. In his speech, delivered outside beneath the vast blue sky, Menzies spoke about growing up in Japarit. It was a moving speech. He said it was a great place, he said, and one of the advantages was that we lived in a community, and this, he said, had invested him with a moral and spiritual standard that he otherwise might not have gained growing up in a more turbulent and bustling community in the city. Today, today Japarit has not changed all that much since Robert Menzies roamed the streets, but it's a pity the local store has been demolished, but you can still glimpse the life that he lived and understand the place that helped shape the man he became. Thank you. Thank you, Troy. I've lost my microphone, so we'll have to share. I hope you don't mind. Um, that was fascinating. And I, I haven't been to Japarit, which is shocking. I've driven past it many times in between Melbourne and Adelaide. And next, next time at Christmas, I'm going to force my nine and seven year old to uh, come and do a tour. So I'll have to borrow your itinerary. They do deserve it. <laughs> they do deserve it. <laughs> um, Troy, I, I was really interested um, in talking about all the, the women in Menzies' life. And um, obviously he was very close to his mother, very close to his sister, Belle, and he and Dame Patty had you know, a famously um, superb partnership. And then his daughter, Heather Henderson, was the apple of his father's eye. What, I mean, I, I'm, this is pop psychology, I know, but it, what can we draw from that, that the women in Menzies' life were those he was closest to and, uh, and those he, he sought counsel from and looked to? Yeah, I think, it, I think it's an interesting observation. Um, I don't, I'm not really into um, pop psychology or Freudian analysis to explain uh, Menzies, um, but, I, but I do think it, it is very interesting um, that here we have, you know, a very loving mother um, who he said was, you know, one of the most inspirational people in his life. Um, he had that relationship with Dame Patty, of course, very close relationship with his sister, Belle. Um, and of course, with Heather, his only daughter, and I've had the pleasure to talk to Heather many, many times and interview her and go to her house. Um, and she explained to me that um, uh, that she did have a, a very special relationship with, with her father. I don't have any sort of psychological answers for that, other than that it's probably just a, a confluence of events, that these very strong, um, very interesting women uh, who he loved very much were very influential in his life. I will make one brief comment, though. Um, Heather revealed to me that there was quite a lot of tension between Dame Patty and his sister, Belle. Um, and uh, she spoke quite openly about that, and, and that caused some friction in their marriage. Um, and Dame Patty found out, um, I think in the 1920s or 1930s, um, that Robert had been giving Belle money um, each week. And, and uh, Heather gave me access to letters between Robert and Belle. And they're very, very affectionate um, to each other. Um, but that made uh, tab Dame, Dame Patty a little bit upset that he was secretly giving her money. And that, I think, is a sign of how much he loved her. So we've got our first question from the internet. Um, which is David Lee from the UNSW Canberra. And his question is, how would you reconcile not volunteering, but on the other hand, supporting Hughes's plebiscites for conscription for overseas service? Yeah, look, it's an interesting, interesting question. Um, I mean, that's just a political position that he took. Um, and in fact, he, it caused him, uh, I think he came to that position very genuinely. It's an intellectual position that he, that he came to. Um, and he gave a number of public speeches um, at that time and, and uh, he was heckled uh, from the audience uh, for, not, for not serving himself. And that would happen later on in his life. So it did have a big effect on him. But, um, you know, and of course, uh, David uh, mentioned uh, the old famous Earl Page attack on Menzies for not serving in World War I. Uh, I don't share in those views. I think as I've tried to explain, there were very significant circumstances within the family. Two sons had already enlisted. Um, Belle had eloped and, you know, she was told by her father, this is a direct quote from Heather, not to darken the family's doorstep again. Um, so these were very difficult circumstances for the family. And I think it's perfectly legitimate uh, that the family had believed that they had made a service as a family to the nation by sending two sons abroad. And another son was needed to help look after the family at home. And I think uh, the attacks on Menzies were, were quite wrong. 
Oh, I could I just ask um, for the benefit of everyone else, particularly those on Zoom, could you just state your name and affiliation? Thanks so much. Tim Lynch, a political scientist here at the University of Melbourne. Troy, you've given us a great paper and I commend you on your terrific book, which I read cover to cover a few months ago. Uh, uh, my question is about the nature of conservatism in a young man like uh, Robert Menzies. In, in the UK, if you're on the conservative side, you grow up calling yourself a conservative with a big C. It, it, the great benefit of being in Australia is you can call yourself a liberal and mean it. What's the difference, do you think, that, that Robert had as a young man in these, in these exchanges with his grandfather, defining a conservatism which becomes a liberalism? Or is, am, I, am I barking up the wrong tree here? Is this a subtlety that isn't apparent in his political maturation? Thank you. Look, this is a complex subject. Um, I like to say to audiences that uh, Malcolm Fraser and Malcolm Turnbull told me the Liberal Party is a Liberal Party. Um, Tony Abbott told me it's a Conservative Party. Um, John Howard told me it's a Liberal and Conservative Party. And Scott Morrison famously said, um, what it is then is what it is now. Um, whatever, so whatever, the, whatever that means, whatever that means, um, nobody really knows. Uh, and the party has a problem in trying to define exactly what these beliefs are. Look, there's no doubt that Menzies shied away from the word Conservative. Um, he didn't want to call the Liberal Party a Conservative Party, and I, I looked at a, a number of papers in his personal collection at the National Library where, he, where this was debated and analysed and discussed. He deliberately chose the name Liberal Party uh, because he didn't want it to be seen as a reactionary party, which was the way he described it. So he steered away from the term Conservative. But of course, Menzies, in his style, in his demeanour, in his clothing, was Conservative. Um, he, had, he had certainly had Conservative values. But I do like the, the sort of analysis that he, he promoted more liberalism within a conservative framework. So Australia was, still had a very conservative social and economic policy in the Menzies era, but he advocated more liberalism within that framework. So that's the way I like to sort of um, look at it. Um, but he did want to be seen as a, as a liberal party not a Conservative Party. And of course, he had a lot of discussions and meetings and visits to the UK and saw the Conservative Party there. he had also had the experience, of course, of the United Australia Party um, here in Australia. And he wanted to steer the Liberal Party in a different direction from those political forces. So, um, you know, I think he was able to explain what liberalism meant. Um, and I think David's contribution about being a party with a philosophy is really important, but it's been very, very challenging for all of Menzies' successes to state a coherent view about what liberalism really is. Uh, Anne, Anne Henderson. Uh, Anne Henderson, the Sydney Institute. Um, I think the thing with a lot of people miss with Robert Menzies because this other person disappeared from Australian history thanks to his, uh, uh, the, the opinion of him in the Labor Party. Robert Menzies worked very closely with Joe Lyons right back from 1929, 1930, when together they raised 30 million pounds to transform a loan. I th could, did you do any work on just how much that collaboration between a Labor man who'd left Labor and Robert Menzies had an effect on Robert Menzies? Because there must have been some challenges there for them both. And it left, Menzies has been left with this patrician, two-dimensional image when in fact a lot of his philosophy is rather soft at the center rather a, a sense of service a sense of looking after the underprivileged whatever for all his and joe lyons as well ideas of having to manage the books and keep the accounts and whatever yeah look i think the lyons relationship is is complex and i appreciate your work in this area and um i did look at a lot of what um um, what Enid Lyons had written about the relationship, and she essentially argued that Robert Menzies um, put her husband into an early grave. Um, 
that, 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 was her, that was her view. And so there was some difficulty in the relationship there. Um, I think Menzies, you know, drew inspiration from a lot of different sources. We've talked about, I talked about his grandfather, who, you know, was the first president of what became the Australian Workers' Union. Um, he had, of course, his father-in-law had been a member of parliament. His father had been a member of parliament. His uncle, he had two uncles that had been a member of parliament. So I think he drew on a number of traditions in formulating his own political views and also his own sort of intellectual understanding of, of issues as he as he came across them. Um, and I'd also think that he had a very good relationship with a number of Labor people. Um, you know, John Cain Senior, for example, he was very, very close to John Cain Senior. So he was exposed and open to and interested in a lot of other alternative viewpoints. I'd never found Menzies to be rigidly ideological um, at all. Um, and now I'm, I'm actually, you know, uh, sort of flabbergasted and outraged that we have this protest um, happening here because Menzies did more for universities than any, any other government. Um, you know, doubled the size of universities, three quarters of students are on scholarships in his time, uh, a tenfold increase in federal funding. It's just crazy um, that he would, be, he would be subject to, or his memory would be subject to a protest at, at this university. And, and in, ma in many ways, um, a lot of those views came from an amalgam of perspectives that he had. I don't see Menzies as, as rigidly ideological. We, we have a lot of other questions, which I'm sorry we, um, we aren't able to get to, but um, hopefully in the morning tea, people sure. can pounce on you, Troy. Thank you so much. Um, that was fantastic. Great. Thank you. Um,